Hello, everybody. Welcome to True Gospel Radio. This is Brother Dakota. And we've got Brother Zach. And um, in this video, we're going to talk about um, John 16, 8. Um, and the topic is, you know, people often say that we can't preach against sin or we can't um, convict anybody of sin because that's the Holy Spirit's job. And yes, we do agree that we can't convict people of sin without the Holy Spirit. But what people don't realize is that we have to work with the Holy Spirit and through our preaching and through our evangelism, people get convicted of sin. Right. And uh, one point that I that I found on this is when you read in John 16, Jesus says, um, if you read two verses or one verse before verse eight, where he says that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin. He says in verse seven, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So what's he saying there? He's not saying he's sending the Holy Spirit out into the world. Where is he sending the Holy Spirit to believers so that we have the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can preach the gospel and through the preaching of the gospel, the world gets convicted of sin. And so then he says, and when he has come unto you. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So people will often use verse nine also to say that, well, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't actually convict people of any sin other than just the sin of unbelief or the sin of not believing on Jesus. What do you think about that, brother? Well, um, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you of unbelief or of not believing on Jesus, then they're agreeing with you that the Holy Spirit does convict of sin. They just think it's certain sins that the Holy Spirit will. So they 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 want to make this weird difference that the Bible never makes over what kind of sin does the Holy Spirit convict of? Does he only convict of certain sins? That seems to be their implications. And a lot of this really stems, brother, from a you know some popular ministers and quotes that we get uh, from people who want to teach things contrary to Scripture about the Holy Spirit's work in the world. And one of the popular ministers we've heard speak. I'm sorry for my video. I don't know why it continues to change like that. But it's in John 16a, as you were saying, Joseph Prince. A uh, very one of the most popular megachurch pastors uh, preached an entire sermon on how the Holy Spirit doesn't do the conviction of sin, which is the direct opposite statement of John 16. It could not be more opposite. I want to quote him for us, the audience, so they know where some of the many a believer in the world professed believer gets these weird ideas. They get them from people who say these silly things. And John 16, 8 uh, is uh, no different for Joseph Prince. Joseph Prince said uh, concerning sin and what the Holy Spirit does in John 16, 8. If we believe our sins, Joseph said, are forgiven past, present, and future, which we don't teach that, but that's what he teaches, then the, that bad feeling we get cannot be the Holy Spirit convicting us of our sin. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you and I, not of our sin, but of our righteousness. Well, it's weird because John 16, 8 says the Holy Spirit, when he comes into the world, will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Joseph seeming to say that the Holy Spirit will only convict the believer of righteousness but the scripture says the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and righteousness and makes the distinction. So he's making this weird thing like the Holy Spirit only convicts of righteousness and only convicts of sin or he only convicts of judgment. Well, the John 16, 8 includes all three. So uh, that it's not making a distinction in John 16, 8 for who he would convict these topics to. 
And that's what they're trying to make a difference about. I don't agree that it's spiritual. In fact, John 16, 8, uh, Joseph Prince speaking on it, even attributed the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting as being a work of the devil in the life of a believer. So if you are a Christian and you have sin in your life, then the Holy Spirit never makes you feel bad. In fact, if you feel bad, that's really of the devil trying to take away your joy, he would say, because your sins are already forgiven. So uh, it's interesting how this perspective that the Holy Spirit never makes anyone uncomfortable, never convicts anybody, sinner or saint. Um, I know a lot of times, brother, open air preaching that those who profess Christ give me often the most problems. And some of the problems they give to me surround my my what I'm preaching about. They're like, why don't you preach the gospel? But then because they come up and they hear me preaching against certain sins in the community or maybe of the event that I have attended or something. And they say, why don't you preach on the gospel as if I'm not preaching the gospel in preaching against sin? And so, uh, you know, the, their idea is, is that it's not our job uh, to preach against sin. That's God's job. And it's God's job to convict people. Our job is to be loving, to smile a lot and to have really white teeth and say all the nice things. And that's kind of their perspective of evangelism in general and the Christian duty. And I just don't think it finds any support in scriptures we'll see today. Amen. Yeah. Um, you know, that point you made about Joseph Prince um, saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't convict believers of sin. If you do a study um, in the Bible, there's two clear verses that talk about um God convicting believers of sin and in Hebrews 12 5 and in Revelation 3 19 um, and it actually uses the same word um, in John 16 8 where it says the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin uh, the, the same Greek word for convict uh, elenko is used in Hebrews 12 5 where it talks about God chastening um, those who are believers it says, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. And the word uh, rebuke there is the same word used in John 16, 8. And, and that was written to believers. Exactly. And Joseph Prince said that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So that's who's right, the Bible or Joseph Prince. Exactly. And also Revelation 3, 19, Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If he doesn't rebuke you, he must not love you if you're in yeah. sin. You know, Jesus even said a very harsh statement that said, you know, if you're not rebuked of him when you're in the wrong, then you're bastards and not sons. You're not his children. So he chastens and rebukes those he loves. Like you as a parent would rebuke and chasten your own child for their benefit. So and he doesn't rebuke us that we might fail but that we might repent. And so it's kind of like the same spirit that Paul used when it came to the, the sinner in the book in the Corinthian church, that Paul's idea of dealing with that man was turning him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his soul may be saved. So Paul said, get this man out of the church, but he didn't say get him out of the church so that he would go to hell, get him out of the church so that he would repent and that he would, his soul would be spared. So um, and we see that that did end up happening uh, in the book of Second Corinthians. So praise God for that. This idea that we're not convinced, convicted and convicted means to be convinced of Elenko, to be convinced of, to be rebuked. And it has this sort of shaming quality to it, which is why a lot of love bug Christians shy away from this is that you know they don't think there's any shame and how many a modern day christian love song and on k love there's no shame there's no shame well there is no shame for those who are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit romans 8 1. but if you're walking after the flesh as a professed believer then the you know if you live after the flesh ye shall die there is shame in that you're trampling on and paul said elsewhere if we continue in sin after coming to know christ then you're trampling under your feet the blood of Jesus and are putting him to an open shame 
and you're doing despite to the spirit of grace, how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who does that? And so, you know, there is a great shame in the believer's life to go back to a lifestyle of practicing sin and then thinking that God would never rebuke you or convince you or convict you. If he doesn't, there's something wrong with you. And that's a that's a that's a sad thing. Mm -hmm. But brother, doesn't doesn't um, John 16, 8 say that the Holy Spirit's only going to convict the world of sin? That that's only people that aren't believers aren't in the church. They're out in the world, right? And that's a great distinction that you made there, brother. That's the distinction that Joseph Prince is trying to even do. He's trying to say, well, OK, he may convince the world of some sins, uh, you know, the bad ones like unbelief or, you know, not believing on Jesus. But he would never convict them of homosexuality or pornographies or adulteries. But, oh, God would never do that to a believer. And what you just quoted, those can you say those two verses again? Hebrews 4, I believe you said. Uh, Hebrews 12, 5. 12, 5, and Hebrews 12, Revelation 3, 19. In Revelations 3, 19. Those are written, like you said, to believers, and specifically they state that he will rebuke, chasten, convict believers in sin. Mm -hmm. I yeah. felt that, brother. I have sinned since coming to Christ, to my shame, and I felt the Holy Spirit's conviction, the great shame of it, and the deep regret. Um, all of that was from the Holy Spirit, and it was his love that he did so it's God's goodness that draws you to repentance and how does he draw us at times but through the sharp chastening of the word of God mm -hmm. amen amen um also in um in Isaiah it, it talks about the Holy Spirit so th this is a verse in the Bible that describes the Holy Spirit it says in Isaiah chapter 4 um verse verse 4 it says when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So that's one of the names of the Holy Spirit in the Bible is the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. That's interesting. What's he judging? What's he burning? Good things? The bad well, things? He's the judging actually um, hypocritical believers in jerusalem right they were judged by god for their apostasy yes they were and we see the great judgment that came through the destruction of the country even when they refused when they refused to repent and harden their necks like hebrews 3 hebrews 2 and 3 says you know they were destroyed and uh well god came to them first in a spirit of judgment spirit of burning chastened them they refuse to hear it. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, oh, here we go, brother. What do Christians say? Oh, God never changes. He changes not. The scripture says uh, he mustn't. He won't change here either. Because, again, the New Testament reveals it. It's his love that would convince you and convict you like a father would their child. Mm -hmm. So another thing is. Um, uh, like we said earlier, people always say, you know, that um, that we can't convict anyone of sin through our preaching. And because they think that way, they avoid any preaching on the topics of sin, righteousness and judgment. They don't preach against sin. They don't preach about holiness and they don't preach about judgment or hell or anything like that. And because of that. Um, there's not very much conviction in most of this style of preaching. Um, and a lot of times people are sitting under this preaching. They don't feel any conviction. And it's not unless they listen to some preaching where where these things are being preached that they actually feel challenged or convicted. Right. You know, John the Baptist didn't believe that. And Jesus said in Matthew 11, 11, there's no greater men, man amongst men, a preacher, except John the Baptist. John the Baptist rebuked Herod and convicted him concerning taking, taking his brother's wife to be his own. In Luke 3, 19, the Bible says, but Herod being convicted by him, by John the Baptist, 
for taking his brother's wife to be his own and was so angry with John for John rebuking him over doing this action that he threw John in prison. And Jesus follows all this up was saying that there's no greater preacher or a man amongst men except John the Baptist. And what it was John, one of John the Baptist's shining moments, but convicting some other human being of sin. Uh, John, th- uh, uh, Luke 319. In the Strongs, like you said, ele- Elenco, it's to, uh, to convict uh, with a suggestion of shame for the person convicted, to bring to light or to expose. In Ephesians 5.11, the Bible says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's the same Greek word, elenko, for to convict, to convince, to reprove, to rebuke, to chide, to chasten. That's what we're being commanded to do as people of the light, a city set on a hill. We're not to have fellowship with the darkness, but we are called to rebuke the darkness of this world. Matthew 18, 15. If you have a fault with a brother, you are to go and tell him his fault, Jesus said. And if we're to tell someone their fault, that same phrase, tell him his fault, is the same Greek word, elenko, which means to convict, to convince, to rebuke, to chasten, to chide. John 3, 20, evil men will not come to the light lest their deeds should be reproved. That means to convict, to chasten, to rebuke. Who did Jesus say were the light of the world? Well, that's us, his bride. And they will not come to the light lest their deeds should be exposed, reproved, rebuked. Many times people will say if you're preaching from the Holy Spirit, that God alone will do the convicting. I heard this in Sunday school, even this past Sunday from the typical church crowd. Oh, it's the Holy Spirit who does the convicting. But John 16, eight says, when he, the spirit of truth has come, as we've already been discussing, he will reprove, that means to convict, the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And the same Holy Spirit is supposed to be inhabiting us, his preachers. And we're supposed to be preaching that the same Christian will say, from the Holy Spirit. Well, what is the Holy Spirit's message? It is sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Uh, I think 1 Timothy 5.20 is very strong. Uh, Them that sin, Paul told Timothy, rebuke before all, so that all might fear. And rebuke here is the same word, elenko, to convict, to convince, to correct, to shame, to chide. Why would Paul want you to chide, shame, correct, convince uh, a a sinning believer in the church? He's talking to people who are in the body. If If someone in the body is in sin, rebuke before all so that all might fear. I think that's very strong towards Uh, opposite of the idea that only the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, because Paul is telling Timothy to do this. Paul is telling a preacher to go and do these actions uh, towards other human beings. One human being who is a Holy Ghost preacher should be telling another human being who is in sin in the church that they need to be rebuked, convinced, convicted before all. 2 Timothy 4.2 Part of the job description of us is to preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove and rebuke, elenco, to convict. So that's part of the job description, Paul told Timothy, when you bear the word in this wicked world, part of your job description is to reprove and rebuke. That means to convict. I've heard believers say, well, God knows my heart. You know, God knows my heart. He knows my motives. So it's not really our job to discuss these sensitive sin topics. Just God knows my heart. So let's just love each other. And that's unbiblical. The sin should be addressed directly. Uh, Paul told Titus, I'm almost finished on my rant, but Paul told Titus to hold fast to God's faithful word that Titus might exhort and convince Elenco the gainsayers. So Titus is called to convict those who oppose God's word. Paul tells Titus, a human being, a man, to convict other men who are opposing God's word. He is called to convict them. 
to convince them. And uh, I think it's even strong, too. We are called to rebuke sharply them that oppose God's word, Titus 1.13. Uh, so I think that those verses alone are a very hefty amount of scripture just in the New Testament. Because if we went to the Old Testament, the modern-day church believer would probably find fault with that. Oh, that's the Old Testament. That's, that's over. Well, that was all New Testament that I just shared for why we— are commanded and have biblical reason to think that as a modern day preacher filled with the Holy Spirit, these biblical verses we read tell us to rebuke sharply, to convince, etc. Those that oppose God's word, those that are in open sin, even in the house of God. Uh, this is something that we are called to do, brother, and it's very hard. And we should do it in the spirit of love, yes, again. But that spirit of love is what's motivating me to speak, just like my father would convict me of sin because he's a loving dad. I, as a, as a, as a leader in the church, I, as a preacher, a pastor, an evangelist, a teacher, if I love the flock that's following me, like Paul rebuked the Corinthians for their good, I will rebuke, convict, convict and convince Elenco, people that are following after me when they're in the wrong too, because I love them. And that's where I think the bridge is often lost. They think that love is saying nothing. When biblically love is saying something, Proverbs 27 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. If, if I choose to just kiss my, my fellow followers who are in their sin and just, oh brother, I love you so much, that secret love, that fake kiss, that's all false. But if I really love them, I openly rebuke. It's better than that fake love. It's better than that fake kiss. And it leads to their benefit in the end if they respond to it out of their voluntary free will. So that's kind of my perspective. I think that's bearing out biblically the idea that there is biblical ground for this. Amen. Amen. Well said. Um, you know, another thing is, when you look at the Bible, after Jesus sa uh, says that he's going to send the Holy Spirit, and then also in at the end of Luke, in Luke chapter 24, when he talks about how he's going to send the Holy Spirit, he says to his disciples, <clears throat> he says, I'm about to send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And right before he says that, um, he gives the reason why he's sending the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose of it? In verse 47, he said um, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So that's one of the main reasons that he sent the Holy Spirit so that we could have the power of the Holy Spirit that through the preaching uh, souls would be saved, that we would have the unction of the Holy Spirit. Um, because, uh, you know, if people are, if people are trying to convict people of sin through the preaching in their own strength, without relying on the Holy Spirit, without being in prayer, without being close to God, being in the word, uh, fasting, all those things, then oftentimes people won't get convicted of sin. If, if all we're doing is, is preaching, but not relying on the Holy Spirit. Um, I was just reading um, a book last night. Um, it, it's called uh, The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit by R.A. Torrey. And in the book, he was talking about several people, uh, pastors and evangelists and missionaries who were preaching the gospel and, and trying to see people get convicted of sin. And they constantly were failing and not seeing anybody um, have any kind of conviction. And then once they started to rely on the Holy Spirit more and pray more, then they started seeing people get convicted. And um, also you see in in the book of Acts, every time people get saved and people get convicted of sin, it's always through um, God using the agency of people preaching the gospel. There's nowhere in the book of Acts where people get convicted of sin and saved without God using somebody to do it, without God using 
somebody's mouth, you know, somebody's actions. Yes. Second Corinthians five, the ministry of reconciliation. You know, I love how, you know, I've heard a minister bear this out before that, you know, the ministry of reconciliation is not finished. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, that was not the ministry of reconciliation. That was making atonement for our sin. Uh, but that was not the ministry of reconciliation. So souls still need to be saved. There's still a harvest that needs to be reaped as Jesus bore out, talking about fields being widened to harvest, but the laborers are few. So the ministry of reconciliation is what we is, I think, what you're kind of bearing out. The idea that God uses people to do God's work in the world. There are not angels flying through the sky preaching the gospel on Sunday mornings that we can visually see. Uh, I believe in the supernatural, and I believe that there's much going on around us that we are not obviously aware of. But generally speaking, God is saving men, not through individual supernatural voice to them directly, but he's given us his voice through his word, and he uses believers to bear out his message in the world, like you're saying. And that's a great point you made, the book of Acts, that um, God's using the agency of people I think it's interesting, too, that the book of Acts happened as it did, and the phrase God loves you in their preaching is not found. And yet the entire world was turned upside down by these people. So I really want to use them as my example because we see their success. And when we look at their their messages that they preached, uh, you know, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, Acts 319, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So the you know no God no phrases saying God loves you no phrases saying God has a wonderful plan for your life if you would just yield to Him uh, no God loves you come home stuff it was all repent all give up your sin all it was very confrontational and very direct uh, that's why the the early church was so hated brother by their community around them the unbelieving Jews they hated them. And they hated them not because they said God loved them. They hated them because they pointed out their sin for rejecting the Son of God. They, Peter was so sharp in his preaching towards these people. He called them murderers of the Son of God. And they cried out, what can we do? And then Paul follows it with what I stated earlier. So you're very correct. When we look at the Bible and we read these sermons preached by men who were obviously had just been filled with the Holy Spirit, who the Bible said were filled with the Holy Spirit. The words they said and how they said them, I think often opposes the modern day view of what love in a minister may always look like. Amen. Yeah, it's funny how you mentioned um, that there's not an angel flying through the sky um, preaching the gospel, because I was going to talk about that um, earlier but I, I forgot about it, but you just reminded me in Revelation chapter 14, verse six and seven, it, it's not until this point in time during the tribulation, when there will be an angel flying through the sky preaching the gospel. But when this time comes, the Bible says um, right here in, in Revelation 14, it says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. So that's the everlasting gospel. It's not Jesus loves you. It's fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Right. Ecclesiastes said, what is the whole duty of man but fear God and give glory to him? And so, you know, after hearing all the matter in Ecclesiastes, the book of the preacher, the, the scripture says, and uh, how he says everything is vain, all is vain. He finishes, what is the purpose of man at all but to fear God and give glory to him? And so, you know, again, that everlasting gospel matches that. And you would think if the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, there would be consistency down through the ages. And you have all the way back all those years ago in Ecclesiastes, the statement is made, fear God, give glory to him. Keep, fear God and keep his commandments. 
And then you go to Revelations, like you stated, the angels preaching the same message, the everlasting gospel. And so, you know, whenever we're out preaching, fear God, give glory to him. This is the everlasting gospel. I'm preaching what Ecclesiastes said. I'm preaching what the angel will be preaching in, in uh, at that point in time in Revelations. And so, but right now, God is using the church. Until the church be taken out of the way, God is using the agency of people. Um, even people in supernatural ways, but he's using people in a common manner every day to bear out this message in the world. Amen. You know, I, I heard... Um, Ray Comfort one time said, um, he said that if you're not preaching sin, righteousness, and judgment, you're not preaching the gospel. And yeah. I, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul said, talks about this list of sins, 1 Timothy chapter 1 for 11, through 11. And he mentions a list of sins. And he said, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God according to the gospel. And so, but part of preaching against those sins Paul was mentioning in 1 Timothy 1, well, Paul was preaching the gospel. And he said, these people will not inherit the, the kingdom according to the gospel. And so if you're preaching the gospel, would, would that include mentioning certain people who won't inherit the kingdom? And so apparently so, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, uh, Galatians 5, 19 to 20, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 11, these lists of sins that people living this way will not inherit the kingdom of God, that's according to the gospel. And so part of preaching the gospel is, is preaching the law of God, the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. So preaching the law has a place. It, it, the law is not made for the righteous man, for the, but for ungodly and for sinner, but for unholy and for profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, Paul said there in 1 Timothy 1. So the law has a purpose. We use it to bring men to Christ. So it's according to the gospel. We need an introduction. Every great message has an introduction. The introduction to God's grace is God's law, is God's judgment. The entire Bible is set up in that manner. You have the introduction of the law. Before you have the introduction of God's good, uh, euangelion, the good news in the book of Matthew on, kind of. And it's revealed in the Old Testament, too, but especially so as we get to the New Testament. So the Bible is even set up in that manner of how God revealed himself to a sinful world. Mm -hmm. Amen. And here's the thing. Um, it, if we're not preaching sin, righteousness, and judgment, and, and if we're not preaching the law of God, preaching against sin and using God's law to show people that they're sinners, then people will never truly understand the gospel in the correct way where they'll, they'll realize that they deserve hell and be convicted of judgment. You know, that that's basically what it means when the Bible says the Holy Spirit will convict men of judgment is that it, like you said, it's a, it's a legal term. Like if you're convicted of a crime, See, people justify themselves in their sin, and very few people actually get to the point where they are willing to admit, and when they realize that they actually do deserve to go to hell for their sin, because people want to justify themselves. People, Nobody wants to think that they're bad enough to go to hell. Everybody wants to think they're a good person, and... Uh, but they need to get to the place where they realize they deserve hell. Otherwise, the gospel doesn't make any sense. It, it, unless they get to that point, then all you're doing, if you're just preaching the love of God, if you're just preaching Jesus and not preaching the law, not preaching sin, righteousness, and judgment, you're just taking a sinful, lost person and you're adding Jesus to whatever they already are. And then you just have a false convert because there's no yeah. root. There's no change. And as we've discussed in previous teaching videos, even Western Christianity has developed an entire theological system to cater to sinners who name themselves as believers. You know, original sin doctrine, then on to penal substitution. Oh, your past, present, future sins are already paid for, so you're good. And so what's this preaching against sin? You know, sin was dealt with by Jesus. We just need to preach on hope and grace and love and, and teddy bears and things of that nature. And so uh, it's 
it it's really, brother, we have gone so long into these false doctrines invading the church for so many years. It's really difficult to understand how we can recover the church from it because they've developed an entire system. My pappy taught me that, buddy. They'll say, so whatever you're saying, that's not what I was taught, uh, told. That's not what I was taught. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult. No matter if you even bring the verse up in your hand and show it to them and say, read this verse for me. What does it say? It's as if they still can't see. And that's in Thessalonians. The Bible says that God will turn men over to a delusion who have no pleasure in the truth, but take pleasure in unrighteousness. And that is sin. So if you have someone who names Christ, but has not departed from iniquity, their pleasure is not in Christ, no matter how much they say it is. Their pleasure is in their iniquity that they've yet to give up. And they are either walking on the line of being turned over to delusion or God has already turned them over so. And so that is a really scary place to be uh, as a human being in this world. Multitudes in the valley of decision we see, the scripture says. And uh, we have entire communities in the church, entire uh, denominations even with false doctrines that cater to this ideal that ultimately presupposes that preaching about sin, righteousness, and judgment just has no place in the modern day church. It's because of background theology that attacks biblical Holy Spirit led messages. And uh, because these false doctrines subvert everything that God does in his church, including what and how his ministers are to preach. Uh, because the devil didn't do away with the church. He just weakened it, diluted it, made it false and powerless, and then uh, attacks anything else that could ever pop up that could cause a threat to his reign uh, of attack within the church world. Of course, the true church is not such. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church that God's elect called out people. But uh, for the general church body that we see that names its name over the building doors, on Wednesday night, Sunday mornings, uh, there are, are many a false one, a many a backslidden one. And unfortunately, a lot of their doctrines, brothers, as I just summarized, uh, presuppose why John 16, 8, such preaching, such convicting of others, it just has no place. It's old fashioned, it's old news, or even downright unbiblical, they'll say. And, uh, I feel sorry for them because to have such a view, it really makes me wonder if God has turned them over to a delusion. Yeah, that's scary. And it's it's sad that the, the church is so deceived. They're so far away from the Bible. Um, you know, and it's obvious when you look at um, a couple more verses um, that really prove that we're supposed to preach sin, righteousness and judgment, because when Paul preached to Felix, in Acts 24, verse 25, he said, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So he preached those exact same things, and Felix was convicted. And he trembled. You know what I mean? He he responded, and Paul did that, what, to another human being. One human being preached to another human being about his sin, uh, his uh, God's expectations of righteousness and future judgment. So, uh, again, I think that blatantly refutes the idea that we are not to do this. Look at the effectiveness of Paul's preaching. I mean, it affected this man. And so what was Paul preaching about that caused such an such an effect? The very things that they say we shouldn't preach. Yeah. And also Micah 3, 8. In the Old Testament, the prophet Micah, um, he was preaching, you know, to backslidden Israel. And he says, but truly I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. I mean, just that verse alone, without adding anything else to it, that totally disproves this. Yeah, that's huge. 
And by the power of God, he did it. So why, why would God empower someone to do something that modern day believers say is unbiblical? There it is right in the scriptures. You just read it. So again, it's just one verse after another uh, from blatant commands to chasten, to convince, to rebuke, to people claiming they were filled with God when they did it. Biblical examples of men doing it, John the Baptist, Paul the Apostle before Felix, all of this to show that, yes, we should preach on sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And yes, we should apply that message to people before our faces as we witness, as we minister. I think a lot of believers, if you can get them to this point in the video, you might have convinced them, okay, 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 the Bible does say that that should be part of our witnessing, part of our preaching. But it's the spirit that you do it in that we would agree disagree with. Oh, it needs to be in love. And it doesn't matter, brother, how soft my voice is. It doesn't matter how much I smile. If I preach on these hard things before people and apply them to people, they are going to get angry with us. And I feel like a lot of times the modern day church judges the effectiveness or even the correctness of what they're they're mm -hmm. saying based off their audience's response to them. You know, seeker-sensitive mentality in the church is ruling. I know how to build a big church. I need to have a really good rock band, a good light show. I need to have the cameras rolling on Sunday morning. It needs to be, the rafters need to be all black, like sort of like a warehouse look. And it needs to have the, uh, like the wood pallets in the front behind the stage with the light bars in it. And it's got to have a certain feel to it. And uh, that's the seeker sensitive mentality cause no offense. And that's the way you do it. And so it's just they're changing their message, the biblical message to fit the audience in front of them. We're never called to do that. We are called to preach this faithful word, as Paul said, in order to exhort and convince the gainsayers in the book of Titus. So, uh, you know, they'll argue well, it's your spirit you're doing it in. I have been preaching, completely pouring my soul out for hours in the open air before, preaching for four or five hours in the beating sun or in the driving rain. And lo and behold, some Christian, for example, on a college campus who just got out of class will show up out of nowhere. They just now showed up and will see a huge audience railing against me and think that I'm suddenly wrong just because everybody else in this a huge crowd of people is upset with me. And they'll completely judge me when they say don't judge based off the audience's actions, not off the words of my mouth. And uh, that's very foolish. You know, to hear the whole matter before you make a judgment is what the Bible says is righteous judgment. And so we have a lot of unrighteous judgment because we have a lot of unrighteous professing believers who have, take fault with us. And uh, they do not even hear the words of our mouths. So that's a great mistake to make that a man we think a man is wrong because of his the response he gets from what he says let's listen to what he says and then make our judgment of the man that seems fair to me yeah you know the the church um these days they um i don't think they really even understand what conviction of sin is mm -hmm. because they've they've reduced salvation down to just making a decision and just saying a sinner's prayer instead of actually, you know, being convicted of your sin, realizing you deserve to go to hell, having godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Um, yes. They don't understand any of that. So when they see people getting angry, people getting convicted, they think that that's like the least effective way to preach the gospel. Right. They're looking for a completely different response because they think salvation is something other than it is. And so the it's amazing how close they skirt salvation but miss it by a mile. And that's the great that's the great serpent at work, the the wily, the uh, the wise the devil, Satan himself, who tricks people. He is very good at it, very masterful. And like you said, they've reduced salvation down to a uh, to just uh, saying the sinner's prayer and and then uh, playing the really harpy sounding feel good music and everybody's crying and then we take them up and get baptized right away and then you need to start your tithing and it's just 
It's just this really one, two, three punch salvation, the ABC Christianity, ask, believe, confess. And so, and though there's truth in that, it, that isn't the sum total. Where's the forsaking of sin? Where's the repenting of sin, which is the most one of the most common phrases in the entire Bible? And then we could do another video at some point even, you know, what does repent even mean? But it means to change your mind uh, about what you're doing. And it, the Bible narrative it displays this idea, like you said, in 2 Corinthians 7.10, godly sorrow and how it produced brokenness in me whenever I was convicted of my sin. And, you know, brother, it's interesting. My personal salvation testimony, uh, whenever the pastor was preaching against sin— he did not know that that was for me, uh, but what he was preaching was convicting me thoroughly, uh, stepping on my toes, if you will, uh, and him not even knowing that that was my issues or that that was my behavior, uh, because by all people's outward judgments, I was the good guy. I did good in school. I did my homework. I played my sports. I got straight A's. I went on to college and did good in college and so I was the good guy, but all the while I had sin in my life and sin in my heart. And it wasn't until that man was preaching that it really stepped on my toes. And I haven't talked to him afterwards. And he's like, you need to repent. You know, you need to forsake your sin. It's destroying you. It's going to lead you to hell. And so those were the most loving words I've ever been told. And uh, did it feel good? Absolutely not. I was afraid. I was, I was afraid to go to sleep that I would not wake up and would wake up in hellfire. But that was the Holy Spirit producing a burning work in my life. And uh, and that separating of sin came through these really hard direct messages that uh, really awakened my dead soul. And George Whitfield said, I think it was George Whitfield, nothing but a loud shout will wake them up concerning his preaching and the great awakenings. They were like, George, why are you so strong? Why are you so abrasive? Why are you so direct in your preaching? Uh, you know, can't you tone it down? And he said, nothing but a loud shout will do. So uh, people are especially, I think, in the modern day, brother, are so used to hearing God loves you. They're so used to hearing that Jesus loves you. They've sang the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. And they have never heard anyone rebuke them for their sin it's the new message it's the new thing to do Re preach against sin that's the new hip thing to do because they're used to the love bug message now and uh and it's doing nothing it's falling on deaf ears but i can say the preaching of against sin is always effective anywhere i have ever been and i've been all over this country preaching that sin, righteousness, and judgment to come in churches of various denominations and college campuses of different sizes, big and small. You are guaranteed to reach the hearts of men if you will preach with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's message is sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Amen. Amen. And like you said, I, I agree with that. Whenever you preach um, to the consciences of people, whenever you preach against sin, you're going to reach them. Uh, it says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, it talks about the conscience. It says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. And uh, there's, it's the amplified translation. There's another translation that, that um, words it a little bit different with it talks more about the conscience, but um, yeah, whenever you preach the law of God, it's gonna convict people. Yeah, Romans chapter two, you know, the conscience of has been given to God to men by God uh, in order to teach them some kind of truth. And the conscience is the seat of moral understanding. You know, God gives us a natural light to moral understanding, a natural perception. Of course, it can be seared. And, of course, it can be destroyed. We see that with sinners. Uh, but you, the conscience innately is there. And moral understanding is a natural God-given revelation in the human intellect by God. It's a friend on the side of the preacher for you to minister to the will of the sinner who's in sin.
that they should change. And they may ignore their own conscience and silence its voice. But when the preacher shows up and stirs the conscience and takes sides with the conscience of the sinner rather than take sides with the sinner, then there are two accusers against the sinner now, one of them being in himself, the conscience of the sinner and the preacher preaching. So I want to awaken the conscience, give it life and voice again in the mind of the sinner. And that is done through the use, as Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, 8, the law of God. Mm-hmm. And Galatians three twenty four, the law of God, a schoolmaster, a tool in your toolbox as a Christian to bring men to Christ. I'm not saying that whenever you're witnessing to someone, you need to yell at them or that you need to uh, become a, a jerk or become overly abrasive. That's the That would be the fault of the minister. But if we use the law of God in a rational and loving manner, loving being, uh, including the open air evangelism, but even love being, you know, the one-on-one voice with your friend, maybe you've been working on for a while, or the coworker that you've been trying to win to Christ. Um, it's It's the fact that you're willing to take sides with God when it comes to your evangelism. That's when you're really going to be effective. And taking sides with God may also mean bearing the reproach that God got, that Jesus got, that whenever he told people the truth, there's a cross we must bear in evangelism. And that cross may be the hatred of men when you tell them the truth about sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. We cannot shy away from it. We can't act like the Bible doesn't teach this because we've already shared 20, 30 verses up to this point of proof opposite of, of the fact that Oh, bro, we just need to teach love. Uh, yeah. We've 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 refuted that, but now I'm exhorting the believers, maybe watching this video, that you have a cross to bear in your evangelism. You cannot, you have no right to shy away from it. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are the Lord's, in your evangelism endeavors. That includes bearing His message. Amen. Um, a couple more points I wanted to talk about real quick before we wrap up is um, one is that there are some people i think that um if you if you think about it that that are trying to convict people of sin without relying on the holy spirit and that would be somebody who's you know preaching the gospel without having a prayer life you know with praying and seeking God and, and, and relying on the Holy Spirit and, and asking God to bring the conviction, asking the Holy Spirit to convict the people you're preaching to of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You know, that would be an example of somebody trying to do it all by themselves. But if you are praying, you are seeking God, then you are relying on the Holy Spirit, even if you're, you know, preaching about sin righteousness and judgment yourself you know it doesn't just because the holy it's the holy spirit's job to do that doesn't mean that we don't also play a part in it right and the other point is is that the church nowadays like we talked about because their their main goal seems to be to make everybody feel loved and feel comfortable um really they've even the pentecostal and charismatic churches that don't preach against sin They've honestly have uh, rejected the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting people of sin. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, Paul said that um, that the devil is is trying to um, deceive believers into believing uh, another in another Jesus, another spirit and another gospel. And that's what's happening, which is really not another. He goes on to say, and even such an angel that would bring another gospel, let him be accursed. So, or anyone who brings another gospel, let him be accursed. And you're you're 100 percent right. God forbid that that ever be us who would deserve such a rebuke. I want to bear the the cross of the Lord. I want to bear my cross that He has given to me. You know, He's worthy. He's on the throne now, but it's I who must die daily. It's I. Who must give up my right to myself as a Christian, as a believer? And in my evangelism, brother, again, the temptation of Satan in evangelism for the believer is not only not to witness, 
But if you've already started your witnessing endeavor and Satan is still trying to still trying to trip you up, his temptation is to get you to say things that are ineffective, unbiblical or lack power. And that would be, again, us shying away from what the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit's message is. And again, John 16, 8 is very plain. Galatians 3, 24, 1 Timothy chapter 1, the law, the law, the law. That is the Holy Spirit's message, sin, righteousness, and judgment. I, The temptation of Satan and evangelism for the believer is to avoid those topics because bringing up those topics brings ridicule from the lost, brings hatred from a God-hating world. And so, um, you know, let us be willing to die to ourselves and to bear his message as we should you know that actually reminded me of another point um real quick is that these people that that say over and over again that the holy spirit is is only the only sin that the holy spirit convicts people of is the sin of not believing in jesus because you know they go to john 16 9 where it says of sin because they believe not on me but if you actually think about this um are people going to hell just because they don't believe in Jesus? Not exactly, because there are many false Christians that even though they do believe in Jesus, they're still in sin and they're still not saved because they haven't been convicted of judgment. They haven't been convicted of the fact that the sins that they're doing makes make them worthy of going to hell. And that's why they're continuing in those sins is because they don't fear God because they haven't been convinced of judgment. Absolutely. That's a great point. It's a threefold thing, sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And if you comply with God at one point, but don't comply with him at another, you're still in the wrong. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, we'll wrap this up. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brother Zach. Um, love what you have to say. Thank you. And um, thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please comment, like, subscribe, and you can click the notification bell if you want to be notified every time there's a new video. And uh, God bless. God bless you, brother.